number 16. Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter number 16. Now before I start reading about the resurrection, and this is resurrection day, in chapter number 15 we've already seen the suffering of the Savior, the suffering servant. He's called a servant in the book of Philippians. And so I'm going to use this outline uh, as the suffering servant, the servant's death, the servant's burial, and the servant's resurrection. In Philippians chapter 2, before I read in Mark, the Bible says this, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. I'm in Philippians chapter 2, if you want to write it down in verse number 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, was made in the likeness of man. And being found in fashion as a man... He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. I don't think there's any question who the Lord Jesus Christ is. Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. The Bible makes that very, very clear that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Bible says in John 1.14 that the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. He is God without a shadow of a doubt. I and my Father are one. Beyond a shadow of a doubt, before Abraham was, Jesus said, I am. So now we know who we're dealing with. God had to become a man. Why? Because He required a perfect sacrifice and mankind is not perfect. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So God had to take upon Himself human flesh, come to this earth, and pay a debt that you could not pay to satisfy his own demands. His demand said, guilty. If you've offended the law, guilty. The law never says try, the law says do. Jesus fulfilled the law, thus satisfying holy God's demands for payment for our sin. Now, when we hear this message that we're going to bring here briefly, when we hear this message, if you will Put your faith and your trust in Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus alone, God will impute to you what you need to go to heaven. Impute means to lay to your account. God will lay the righteousness of His dear, darling Son to your account and let you go to heaven. Now that's, that's great. That's wonderful news. That is good news. All because He died According to Mark chapter number 15, uh, the Bible says in verse number 16, 17 of Mark 15, uh, look, at verse, uh, look at verse 17. They clothed him with purple, plaited a crown of thorns, and put it about his head. And he began to salute him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And then they smote him. They smote him upon the head with a reed and did spit on him. Uh, they, they mocked him is what the Bible said in worship in verse 20. Mocked him. They took that purple robe away from him, put his own clothes, led him out to be crucified as they mocked him after they had scourged him and beat him unmercifully in a mangled mess. The Bible says in Isaiah 52 that his visage was so marred. His visage was so marred. He was unrecognizable. We knew he had a figure of a man, but unrecognizable with his features. As those bones begin to, uh, of, of the bones, a bit of bones that was in that scourging whip begin to rake across his body and tear the flesh from his face. And the Bible said, tore his flesh a hand's breadth. How do I know? The Bible says in the book of Psalms, Jesus said, my bones stare at me. They raked his flesh off of his bones, a mangled, bloody mess. That wasn't enough. They had to mock him. They hung on the cross and said, If thou be the Son of God, come down off of the cross. If you be the Savior, come down and show us so that we may believe. I'm telling you, dear friend, you better be glad he didn't come down. He didn't come down. He stayed till the end. The Bible says that it is finished. The work of redemption is finished. Jesus died, gave up the ghost, died, and was placed in a tomb. But he didn't stay in that tomb. Thank God he didn't stay in that tomb. So we see the suffering of our Savior. We see the death of our Savior. We see the burial of our Savior. 
in chapter number 15 and verse number 42 through 47. We find that Joseph of Arimathea, as you saw in the play, he carved out in his own garden a tomb. The Bible had prophesied that Jesus would be laid where no man was ever laid, a new tomb. And so Joseph took the body of Christ, him and Nicodemus, and we met Nicodemus in John chapter 3, him and Nicodemus took the body of Christ and they wrapped it and put some uh, myrrh on it and so forth temporarily till the women could get there on the first day of the week. And they laid him in a tomb. But that's not where he stayed. Amen. Look at chapter 16 of Mark. The Bible said, And when the Sabbath was past, when the Sabbath was past, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Siloam had brought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. And very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came into the sepulcher at the rising of the sun. Now, the Bible makes it very clear that Jesus Christ was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. He died for our sins, not His, and He was raised for our justification. Jesus is just. He was raised for our justification to prove what He did on Calvary is sufficient to save anyone that will believe Him. Amen? He raised again in bodily resurrection. So a dead Savior cannot save anybody. And we've said this last week in the last four or five messages. We said that a dead Savior cannot save anybody and there is no gospel without the resurrection. If we stopped at the cross, if I had stopped, closed my Bible and said, I'm sorry folks, he's in the grave, there would be no gospel. That's good news. The good news is that he rose again for our justification. Amen. Thank God he did. He rose from the dead. Now the Bible says in chapter number 16, verse number 1, that the Sabbath is past. I'm going to teach you something in a very short time if you'll let me. Amen. And you will listen. And maybe you have some preconceived notions. But if you will just listen, this thing will, will present itself in, in a Bible truth that you won't forget. I'm going to read to you out of John chapter number 19 here just for a moment. John chapter number 19, verse number 31. The Bible said, The Jews therefore, because it was the preparation that the bodies should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day. For that Sabbath day was an high day. That Sabbath day was a high day. It wasn't your regular Saturday Sabbath. This particular Sabbath day was a high day. And because it was a Sabbath, Sabbath does not mean seven. Sabbath means rest. There's no servile work can be done on the Sabbath. No work. Because the bodies could not remain, because the next day was a high day, the bodies had to be taken down. Now, if you will, hold your place while you're... Hold your, I'm going back to Mark, but I want you to hold your place in Mark. And let's go all the way back to Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter number 12. And if you, you'll follow along now, or listen, if you don't have your Bibles, you can write it down. It's going to help you. It's going to help you get a hold of Jesus staying in the grave three days and three nights. As Jonah was in the whale's belly three days and three nights in the fish's belly, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. Now you do not get three days and three nights out of Good Friday. You just don't get it. Friday, Saturday, at the most two. At the most two, if you believe in Good Friday. I believe every day is a good day. It's a good day God has made it. We should rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. Are you in Exodus 12? Let me show, let me show you something. In Exodus chapter number 12, look at verse number 3. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. 
Now this is a Passover. You remember when the death angel came by and smote the firstborn in Egypt? All right, here it is right here. Get you a lamb without blemish. Put it up. Watch it. Make sure it hadn't got any blemish. The Bible said in verse 6, you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. This is Passover. This is Passover. They kill the lamb the 14th day. Jesus Christ died at exactly the same time of the evening oblation. He died at the same time of the evening oblation. All right, now, we got verse number 6. Let's go on here to verse number 12. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Now look here. All right, this day, this day of the, the lamb being slain, this day of Jesus Christ being killed shall be unto you for a memorial. Verse 14, it's a Passover day, all right? And then it says seven days in verse 15, Shall ye eat unleavened bread? Even the first day ye shall put away leaven out of your houses. For whosoever eateth leavened bread, from the first day until the seventh, that soul shall be cut off from Israel. Now look here. In verse 16, the first day after the lamb that was slain, the first day, the Bible said there shall be a holy convocation. That convocation is a Sabbath. And in the seventh day, there shall be an holy convocation to you. Now, convocation is no manner of work shall be done in them except everything that a man should eat. That's it. No work shall be done. All right, I submit to you the 14th day. Now, if you want to write these down, write down Leviticus chapter 23 and verse 6 and 7. And also write down Numbers chapter number 28, verse 17 and 18. It says the same thing. After the death of the Passover, the very next day was a special Sabbath. So if Jesus died Wednesday, a special Sabbath was Thursday, your regular Saturday, seventh day Sabbath, then that would make it three days and three nights in the grave. And when they came very early, Mark chapter number 16 and verse number 2, the Sabbath is passed, that regular seventh day, Saturday Sabbath had passed. The women came and brought sweet spices to finish what Joseph and Nicodemus started over in John chapter number 19, verse 39. It said Nicodemus and, jo and, and uh, Joseph of Arimathea, the ladies came to finish what they started. The Bible said they came very early, very early. Now, there's no contradiction in the Word of God. No contradiction whatsoever in the Word of God. The Bible says in uh, Mark they came very early. In Luke 24 it says very early. And all of the Gospel writers has the account of Christ's resurrection. So Luke said very early. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 28, verse number 1, as it began to dawn. And then um, John chapter number 20 and verse 1, when it was yet dark. Well, now which one's right? Very early at the rising of the sun or when it was dark? They're all right. They started out before pre-dawn. And by the time they got to the tomb, it was sunrise. Well, let me just tell you something. Let me make an analogy here. The closer you get to Jesus Christ, the clearer and brighter it gets. Amen. Amen. You begin to accept truth. You begin to accept that what we've already read is true. Jesus did die for my sin. He was judged of Almighty God for our sin. He was bruised for our iniquities, is what the Bible says. He, he, he satisfied completely the demands of a holy God. He reconciled the world. He took all of the enmity that was between man and God. He took it out of the way, nailed it to his cross. The middle wall of partition is torn down. All of the handwriting of ordinance that was against us. He took it away, nailing it to his cross. There is nothing between God and myself. Reconciliation has been made. 
Peace has been made by the blood of Christ. So let me ask you, how close can you get to God? As close as you want to get. Close as Christ. Amen. As close as you want to get. Why? Because everything that was in the way, Christ took it away. Amen. Christ took it all away. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank God for the blood of Christ. All right. Now, we said a dead Savior can't save anybody. Now, again, we found out there's no contradiction. Started out dark. By the time they got to the tomb, it began to dawn. And again, the closer that you get to truth, the brighter it gets. So please listen to what's being preached. Read your Bible. Find out what Christ did is sufficient. Believe him. Believe him. Believe that he rose again the third day for our justification. He's alive. He's our great high priest. Believe him. Amen. All right. Now, as they walk, we find out they're useless. These women, they're walking toward the tomb, but on the way, they sure had some worries. And we find out that these worries were very useless. If you'll notice in verse number three, it says, and they said among themselves, who shall roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulcher. Who shall roll us away the stone of, uh, of the door from the sepulcher? Well, we're going to find out that big hindrances and worries to us are but tiny opportunities to God. If you and I, if anyone proceeds in the right direction, God will reveal and remove all hindrances threat threatening to halt our progress. How do I know that? Well, he did it with the wise men. He did it with the wise men. You can go all the way back to Matthew chapter number 2. You can find out they came to Bethlehem from the east, and uh, then they had to go to Herod. Then what happened? The star reappeared. And they found Jesus in Bethlehem. The shepherds found him. You know that Paul, on his missionary journey, was stoned and beaten and shipwrecked and, and, and give up for dead several times, hungry and wet and cold. But God brought him all the way through. And by the way, the world heard the gospel. The world heard the gospel. Thank God for God removing those, those, those hindrances in our path. So if you want to find Christ, he will remove those hindrances that threaten to halt what you're trying to do. All right, now we get to verse number four. We find out that they, they, uh, their tune had changed. We look at their wonder. The Bible said in verse four, when they looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away for it was very great. I found this to be true too as well, congregation. Faith is always better than fear. Faith is always better than fear. Had the women stayed at home and debated ways which to overcome their problems, they would have lost the greatest, greatest thrill of their lives. And that's to see that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. But they went. But they went. It's always a mistake to spend time dreading the problems of tomorrow. The Bible does say in the book of Matthew, chapter number 6, verse number 34, Therefore take no thought for tomorrow, for tomorrow shall take thought for the things of itself sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. So we see we need to be walking by faith. Walking by faith. In verse number 5, 6, 7, and 8 of Mark chapter number 16, they finally get to the tomb and they come in contact, number one, with the angel of the Lord there in verse number 5. And entering into the sepulcher, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white garment, and they were affrightened. Matthew, uh, Matthew gives an account of the same thing, and he gives a little bit more explicit uh, description of the angel. And so we see this angel sitting right there, and of course the, the women saw him. A young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white garment. I was thinking about that too, you know, the angels in heaven. Thank God for the messengers that God sends. Thank God for the, for the um, just thank God for the word of God. Amen. Um, and another thing I was thinking, just by, the way of, just by the way of application, the angels were created in that six days of creation. We know that. Everything that was created was created 
when God, in those six days of creation. Now that was at least 6,000 years ago. And the Bible says it was a young man. There was an angel clothed as a young man. I begin to read in the Bible where Job chapter number 33, verse number 25 said that our flesh, our flesh shall be fresher than a child's. He shall return to the days of his youth. Though skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. And my flesh shall return to a, the, the, same, the, the same as a young, virile, young man. <laughs> amen. Some of us say amen to that now. Some of us sitting there holding your aches and pains already today, you know, waiting for the preacher to shut up so you can go home, you know. So, but we're going to have a body fresher than a child's. You see, it is all because that Jesus Christ rose again from the dead. He rose again from the dead. So we have the assuring message here in verse number 6. And the Bible says in verse 6 of Mark 16, Be not affrighted, you seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. Now, Christianity invites investigation. It does. Christianity does not just say, believe what this man says up here. Christianity invites investigation. So we get our Bible and we start reading. We said how that he was seen above 500 brethren at once. We've seen how that the, not only the Bible, but history books prove. And I, I don't go by history books, but history books have tr some truth in them. But this Bible trumps them all. The Bible says he is. I have proof that he's risen because I'm born again and he lives within me. Can you say that? Can you say that? I am born again. I know I'm going to heaven. So I have proof. So heaven, Christianity invites investigation. But here, it doesn't need to advertise its product because the empty tomb, if it needed to, the empty tomb would be sufficient. Amen. Would be sufficient. Other religious systems proudly draw attention to the, to the graves of their ancient leaders, but Christians point to an empty tomb. And the Bible says in the book of 1 Corinthians, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Death does not have any sting for the child of God. And the grave certainly doesn't have any victory. Thank God for the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to stop a little early. Amen. Amen. All righty. Let's stand to our feet, please. If you have any questions at all, any questions concerning the resurrection of Christ, what he did on Calvary is sufficient to get you to heaven, then please, please, we're just going to sing one stanza of, of a song. One stanza, unless God just prolongs it, whatever He does. But one stanza, but if you need some help or you have any questions, if I can help you, I'm going to ask you to come. I'm going to ask you to come. You got some things on your heart you need to settle with the Lord, I'm going to ask you to come. As we play and as we sing, Will you come? Thank you. Thank you for, for being in the house of the Lord today. Amen. All right. Brother uh, Kirk Kennedy, if you'll dismiss us in prayer. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for the hard work on the, on the Easter play. Thank you for that. All right. And all that were involved.
Let's pray. God, we are so grateful for this day, grateful for the Resurrection Day, and we're just thankful for Christ and all that means for us today to be born again. Thank you for all these folks that are here today, especially our first-time visitors. We're asking a special blessing for them. Thank you for all these children, and we're asking your blessing now as we go about our separate ways for the afternoon, that we enjoy family and are back in our places tonight. We ask it in Christ's name, and all God's people said, Take care, big friend.